Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, to Bianca, thanks very much for that, that intro and getting us uh, up and running in terms of the <coughs> webinar this afternoon. Uh, as she said, <coughs> certainly a, a wet and uh, wild Durban. <coughs> I think uh, everybody's trading their cars in for boats, but uh, we'll try the best that we can. We've had some severe weather, interruption to internet, and uh, everything else. So. Without further ado, let's just jump into the course. And uh, just thanks to our, our sponsors in terms of Plumlink, and also to you uh, for taking the time out this afternoon to uh, go through the course in terms of uh, SANS 10254, the non compliance notices. And uh, just sit back, relax, and uh, I'm sure 80% of this you know, but uh, it's that 20% that uh, you may be not sure of or uh, need a brush up on that's going to assist you going forward. So thank you once again. So in terms of our, our course outline, it's just the objective, overview, table uh, A, B, and C uh, in terms of bullets with regards to the PILB, non-compliance notices, and then obviously in terms of closing. Our next uh, slide coming up is just a poll. So uh, if you can answer that just as soon as possible, as quickly, push that uh, button. But here comes the poll. Do you provide the client with a non-compliance notice prior to an installation of a hot water cylinder? So I think that's the key one um, in terms of uh, compliance. Do you provide the client with a non-compliance notice prior to an installation? Okay, we have 25% of the votes in. Okay, 55. Guys, as I mentioned, if you can please hop on those responses as soon as you can. It just makes it a lot faster for us. Let's just have a look. Okay, 60% of the votes in. And then we have a nice split here. Okay, we're going to close the poll now. Right, in terms of uh, split, we got 50% always, 17% never, and 33% sometimes. Again, as Bianca said, quite an interesting split in terms of uh, the poll results, and I think you know the key item there is that the requirement in terms of SANS 10254 is that we need to make the client aware of any non-compliance in writing uh, when it comes to a geyser installation. And I think the key thing for that in terms of uh, going forward is that you don't have hiccups at the end of a job where you finished doing what you were supposed to do, and then uh, all of a sudden you come up with that non-compliance notice afterwards, so I think it's key for me and uh, the way that I would uh, request guys to do it is to actually go through that installation and make sure that the areas of non-compliance are brought to the attention of the consumer prior to you doing the work. It's not to say that you must go out and then do it, but it's again just, just noting that those items are there. So we'll touch on that as we go further into the, the webinar this afternoon. So in terms of our objective is to provide you with an understanding of the critical areas of compliance related to SANS 10254. So I think very key that, uh, that compliance in terms of 10254 <coughs> There's been a lot of, uh, uh, let me just go back to the other slide here. There's been uh, changes in terms of compliance regulations and standards as well as critical safety and hazard aspects of pressurized hot water storage vessels. Great focus has been placed on the installation and the compliance of these standards and regulations. As a result of the changes, lack of understanding and in some cases misinterpretation or misguidance, a state of confusion has uh, been created and a further lack of understanding has creeped into the industry sector. So I think basically in a nutshell what it's saying is that uh, there's been considerable changes. Uh, as an example, yesterday, uh, I had a, not yesterday, Friday, I had a, a 
communication with regards to individuals that don't know that you are required to use 45 degree bends, for example, uh, instead of 90s on the TP discharge pipe. So again, uh, this has been out there since uh, I think 2012 and when those amendments were done and changed, but yet there are, st are still individuals out there that are unsure uh, in terms of what uh, is required in terms of the standard. And secondly, and with no disrespect to anybody in the room, is that uh, a large majority of the contractors that I uh, communicate with on a daily basis is that uh, the guys don't know the standards. So they, they haven't uh, looked at the standards in terms of what the requirements are for a fully compliant uh, geese installation. So although uh, I think it was last week I received 11 uh, reports in terms of geese installations where the guys had actually ticked that the geezer's installations complied to SANS 10254, and yet when looking at it, areas in terms of lagging of the inlet, hot water piping, etc., uh, the type of timber being used for the support of the tray, pipe work for the tray is not being supported, etc., etc. So every one of those 11 reports were non-compliant in terms of the the standards. So again, just making sure that you are aware of what those standards are uh, with regards to your uh, installation. So what is a compliance table? This describes the critical areas of compliance in a new electrical keys installation, replacement and repair or maintenance. So where new ones installed or any maintenance that's been done. Who does this affect? <clears throat> it affects manufacturers, suppliers, merchants, retailers, installers, and the entire value chain must comply and take note of the following coming industry notice. So again, in terms of this, uh, it's just making sure that everybody's on the same uh, page when it comes to uh, installations and what's required in terms of the manufacturers, suppliers, merchants, and retailers, as well as the installers. I think uh, everybody needs to uh, take cognizance of these notices and they actually have, it has been communicated through the manufacturers forums, et cetera, in terms of uh, these critical areas of uh, compliance. So in terms of the amendments, that's where we sit in terms of uh, who it affects. Our next one coming up, again, guys, is a poll, so if you can get your fingers ready to push the buttons. A non-compliance notice must be provided to the insurance company, the owner, the owner, and user. So if we can quickly jump onto the buttons in terms of that compliance notice, who gets it? Okay, we have 30%, 50% of the votes in. A lot faster. We do have a few that aren't attentive, so we'll just skip over those guys. Um, and Tony, I will come to your question up next. Or well, let's 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 answer it while we're waiting. Um, Tony would like to know: confirm the 45 degree bend. Is it only on the TP valve outlet, not on the rest of the geyser installation? 45 degree bends on the TP valve as well as the discharge pipe from the train. Okay, we have a much bigger percentage of the votes in. If there are any people having difficulties with um, voting, just pop me a question in the questions tab and let me know what's going on so that we can work on that. Um, I'm going to have to move on with 80% of the votes in. Here come your poll results. Okay. 6% in terms of the insurance company, the owner 63%, the owner, user 31%. Okay, those that answered number three, the owner, user is the correct answer. Okay, this, in terms of SANS 10254, uh, in terms of non-compliance, it refers to the owner stroke user. The reason both is that the owner may not necessarily be the user, the property may be rented out and uh, the user. So again, in terms of that, the owner and user in terms of the non-compliance. And basically what that does, and I think we need to just emphasize in terms of this non-compliance and what, what the reason is behind it. This is not to mess plumbers around or to create uh, unsurety in the market. Basically what it is there is to cover yourself. Okay, so that in the event of there being a problem, going forward after you've worked on that installation, and that they now try to hold you or hold you liable 
for that installation or any areas of non-compliance, you've actually covered yourself in terms of documentation. And basically what it means is that you transfer ownership and responsibility of that installation to the consumer uh, once you've submitted the documentation to them. So once you've made them aware of the non-compliance, it's up to them to either rectify or uh, ensure that the installation is upgraded. But your responsibility uh, lies in bringing to their attention the areas of non-compliance. The entire supply chain must comply with all areas of SANS regulations related to Giza. The following tables highlight the critical areas only. So we've identified critical, critical areas only. Uh, the compliance table has been split into three distinct areas. Table A, which is critical compliance for the installation of new fixed electric geysers. Table B, which is the critical compliance for the replacement of fixed electric geysers. And table C, critical compliance for the repairs and maintenance of a fixed electric geyser. So very clear, distinct uh, uh, three tables in terms of what those requirements are. <coughs> compliance table A. Now, as we go through this, you'll see that more and more it says certificate of compliance, certificate of compliance. So I'm not going to... Uh, uh, use those words every single time. So basically what we'll just do is, uh, is just put the uh, COC required. Right, in terms of the regulations, SANS 10252 Part 1 and SANS 10254, all new fixed electrical storage water heaters installations must comply with all the requirements of SANS 10252 Part 1 and SANS 10254. A new installation is defined as where any fixed electrical storage water heater geyser that is not being replaced with any fixed electric storage water heating geyser installation that forms part of a, a newly constructed dwelling or building, an existing dwelling or building where an additional fixed uh, geyser is installed. So again, very clear in terms of what that is. So any new builds, uh, alterations where a new geyser has to be installed, the installation of that uh, hot water cylinder must comply with SANS 10254. And bearing in mind uh, 10252 part one in terms of the pipework and the way in which it's connected. And there are other requirements in terms of 10400XA and SANS 204, which make reference to energy efficiency in buildings and in terms of the lagging of the system. So I think very key in terms of that. So if you've got plans or alterations that are being done and you've got a, a plan that's been submitted, the requirement is very clear that all new installations need to be carried out and installed in accordance with SANS 10254. Our next one coming up is another poll. Uh, this, I think, is our third, and uh, there'll be one more after that. So if we can jump onto that poll. <coughs> Research has shown that non-compliance notices are not current practice within our industry. This is due to A, apathy, not knowing the standards, and to B, not being a requirement of the consumer. So any one of those, A, B, or C, if you could just answer those poll questions. While we're waiting for those to come through, we've got from Rudy, is it, le is it legal when a 40 millimeter pipe is used as an overflow pipe on a drip tray? Uh, if, you go, if you go and have a look at what the standard is, there are terms in terms of the flow rates of the actual pipe from the actual uh, hot water cylinder uh, in terms of it being 40 more, but you'll also talk it goes back to the connections. So all of the connections as far as I know in terms of uh, geese installations are 50 more in terms of the trays and it speaks in terms of being piped the same way, but the requirements are in terms of how many liters per minute can actually flow through that pipe. So in terms of the stats, I don't have that right now, but in terms of the standard 50 more PVC, uh, but I know uh, somewhere, and uh, if we've got Rudy's details, I'll get it and I'll forward it through to you. And the next one, where can I purchase the new SANS 10252 and 10254 editions? Okay, those you'll get through SABS. SABS have them. The current uh, SANS 10254 is up for review and uh, should be out in July. And this is why we're touching base in terms of these webinars, because these are incorporating some of the changes that are going to come through in terms of uh, uh, the new SANS 10254. So SABS have them. You can purchase those. I also have also put together some uh, handbooks in terms of uh, practical guides to assist uh, individuals in terms of uh, uh, the requirements. 
Um, the value, again, when we looked at all of the standards uh, a couple of months ago, the cost was exceptional. It was like over 6,500 Rand to purchase all of the SANS documentations and therefore why IOPS has put together some of the practical guides. So uh, yes, you can go onto SABS's website. Uh, you can also Google it um, in terms of what's there uh, and it'll be able to give you an indication of what those standards are. In terms of our poll, uh, apathy, 20%, uh, not knowing the standards, 60%, not a requirement of the consumer, 20%. Again, very interesting in terms of the way in which the poll has uh, brought back some results to us. And I think the key one, not knowing the standards, I think that's one of the biggest ones. So those guys that have put uh, answer two, I think that is the biggest problem that we have within the industry is that a large majority of the contractors out there are not sure of the standards and therefore if you don't know something, how is it that you can actually report on it? So it's like me trying to provide a, a, a report on somebody's car engine or whatever. I just wouldn't know where to start. So I think the key thing is just to make sure that um, yeah, you know the standards and I think a lot of guys look at standards as being uh, restrictive and I think for me the standards are there to uh, assist you and, and they will in terms of your bottom line. I mean if you apply those standards and work according to those standards and make the client aware of what those standards are, then your job is half done because you've separated yourself from those other 60% or 70% of guys out there that are not doing it. So again, it just makes you look a little bit more professional and uh, it, it's key that you understand exactly what you're doing right and what you're not doing uh, or what you're doing incorrectly. So just making sure that, that you cover that. So uh, in terms of uh, compliance table B, compliance table B for the replacement of a fixed electric storage water heater. Regulation, all replacements of a fixed electric storage water heater installation must comply to the SANS 10252.1 and 0254. Temperature pressure valve, a temperature pressure valve must be installed. Temperature pressure valve shall be of the same pressure rating. The pressure rating of the temper and pressure valve may be less than the rate of pressure of the storage water heater, but shall never exceed it. The discharge pipe from the temper and pressure valve shall never be joined together with other discharge pipes. I think one of the key things is that they can't be joined together uh, in terms of the uh, uh, temperature pressure uh, discharge pipe and that of the expansion relief. So just making sure that those are done uh, independently of each other must be led to a discharge point which is visible outside the building and in a position where the discharge from the pipe will not cause a nuisance and cannot be blocked. So again, making sure that uh, the discharge pipe uh, is in a place where it's not going to create a problem, uh, especially blocks of flats, uh, an area that comes up very often in terms of installations where a geyser has been installed prior to that and that's non-compliant due to the fact that there's additional pipes that need to go out, etc. So making sure that those pipes discharge correctly and certainly not in terms of above baths or in showers um, and in a place where they can't become blocked. So in a replacement, again, yes, you're in the roof space and you're removing that hot water cylinder, but just take cognizance of the fact of where do these pipes actually discharge. It will not be the first or last time that uh, a contractor has replaced a geezer without going to notice exactly where those discharge pipes are and don't take it for granted that the original contractor uh, knew the standards and positioned them correctly. So just make sure that you cover your bases in terms of that. So it talks about uh, waste pipes will be installed in a manner that will obviate the, or the development of water traps which could prevent the free return of air into the system. Size not less than the size of the outlet of the valve for which the pipe is intended. Always be of metal and inclined downwards away from the valve. Thermal insulation must be installed on one meter uh, on the temperature and pressure discharge pipe and then shall not be greater than 45 degrees. So again, in terms of that insulation, it's a key component, as I said earlier, in terms of SANS 204, energy efficiency in buildings and 10400 XA. It's making sure that one meter on your, your temperature pressure discharge pipe is lagged and the same with your one meter on your cold water inlet to your geyser is lagged and uh, as we get to lagging here, uh, yes, on a new installation, all of the pipe should be lagged, uh, but for those that where um, it hasn't been done, three meters in terms of your hot water. Expansion control, an expansion control valve must be installed on all closed hot water heating systems. The expansion control valve shall have the same pressure rating as other valves used in the system. The pressure rating of the expansion control valve may be less than the rate of pressure of the storage water heater, but shall never exceed it. 
an isolating valve, gate valve, non-return valve, or any other flow control device shall not be provided between an expansion control valve and the water heater. Again, this is a, an area in terms of replacement of geysers that becomes a problem in that uh, there are valves possibly between the pressure control valve and the inlet of the uh, hot water cylinder. And if that is the case, then you've basically taken away the warranty uh, for that hot water cylinder in that it cannot, the water that's been heated cannot expand. So if there's any valve or anything between that, then uh, it makes specific reference to uh, the fact that that geyser will not be able to expand and therefore puts uh, uh, the hot water cylinder at risk. And in the event that it fails and a warranty claim is lodged, then there will be no warranty. Control. Just a quick question. Why is lagging on the TV pipes? And they'd also like to know, even if not in a freezing zone or area. Okay. Quite simply, as I've said earlier, SANS 204 and 10400 make specific reference to energy efficiency in buildings. So therefore, the heat that's transferred from the hot water within the cylinder will transfer back through the cold water. It will also be transferred through the temperature pressure discharge pipe, which basically means that you're getting heat loss. So in terms of that heat loss and in terms of energy efficiency, and again, going back to uh, lagging of hot water pipes, again, if you look at 10252 part one, it speaks about freezing and areas where freezing can occur. It also makes reference to coastal regions that if uh, coastal regions obviously don't have freezing, uh, I'd beg to differ after the last couple of days in Durban, but anyway, don't get confused between the two. Okay, and let, let's just make that very, very clear that there are two reasons for lagging a hot water line and the piping around that. Okay, so if you're a coastal area and the consumer or anybody tells you that lagging is no is not required in a coastal area, then you make reference to the SANS 10400 XA and the SANS 204, which makes specific reference to energy efficiency in buildings. So basically what it is, is to retain the heat loss from the piping. So any one of you being a plumber out there, you've gone up to a diesel installation and you've put your hand on the cold water inlet, you'll see that that heat transfer actually goes through from the geyser onto the piping. So you'll actually feel that the, the, the cold water pipe actually feels like a hot water pipe. So it's there specifically for energy efficiency in buildings. Okay, we've got an energy crisis in this country as well as water, and that is why the requirement of the lagging is there to insulate uh, uh, and retain the heat loss from the cold water and the TP discharge pipe. I hope that answers the questions, B. Right. Installed on compliance table B, isolating valve. Isolating valve must be installed on the inlet pipe of the pressure control valve, uh, if, applicable, uh, if applicable on the inlet side of all float valves and shall not be provided between any expansion relief device or vacuum relief device. So again, Guys, this becomes a bone of contention. I've seen guys putting lever valves, etc., between the two, and the standards make very clear reference to no valve. Okay, it doesn't say lever valve or ball valve or ball stop or whatever. It says no valve. Quite simple. Uh, in terms of the tables, if you are in a position where your uh, expansion relief valve is upstream of an isolating valve, in terms of the standards, there are areas where you can actually reposition that expansion relief valve uh, to the anti-siphon loop above the geyser, position it there directly on the line uh, without cutting out that valve uh, in terms of a maintenance uh, core, and therefore you still have the integrity of the warranty of the hot water cylinder in place. Basically what you've done is just ensured that uh, the expansion of the water can take place. Vacuum breakers. Vacuum control valves should be installed on both hot and cold water pipes to and from the heater to ensure water heater is vented. Vacuum control valves should be installed on both hot and cold water pipes to ensure that siphonage of the water heater is prevented. Very straightforward in terms of, of uh, those requirements. The pressure control valve. The pressure control valve shall have the same pressure rating as other valves used in the system. The pressure rating of the pressure control valve may be less than the rated pressure of the storage water heater, but shall never exceed it. The location of the pressure control valve must be related to the required downstream flow pressures 
see requirements of the expansion control valve if the pressure control valve incorporates an expansion control valve. Again, lots of big words and everything else. So basically it's in terms of where you position that pressure control valve or PRV. And if there is any interruption, whether it be a non-return valve, isolating valve, anything that is downstream of that, and it is going to affect the uh, expansion relief of the actual cylinder, you can relocate the uh, expansion relief. So again, taking it off the main body, plugging it on the main body, taking that, putting a, a reducing T on the anti-siphon loop, there is a table in terms of 102.54 in the annexures, which actually shows you where you can put that. Right, in terms of compliance table B, <coughs> this is again one of those items that, that comes into play. The support structure for the drip train water heater must be placed on tar beams that are supported on load bearing walls at least grade 5 of SANS 1783-2. That is the type of timber that is required to be installed, so it's not some piece of plank you find in the backyard or whatever. This is specific in terms of what timber can be used of a size 114 by 30 millimeters or bigger and may not be spaced more than 500 millimeters apart. Each foot of the water heater must rest on a support beam and no water heater or storage tank of capacity exceeding 200 liters shall be attached by means of brackets or hangers to a load-bearing masonry or concrete wall or to any other vertical structural element. So again, just making sure that you do that. Uh, umpteen times we've gone out to installations in terms of uh, geysers and roof spaces and again, <coughs> timber support structure incorrectly or not spaced correctly. So just making sure that, that you cover that in terms of the replacement. Drip tray installed in the correct manner. The size of the tray should be such that it will cover the total area of the heater and associated water control appurtenance. Okay, another word that I wish they would take out of these uh, uh, things. Don't they know that it's plumbers that are reading this thing? So anyway, they're talking about valves, vacuum breakers, etc. Drip tray discharge pipe must be installed and sloped and supported towards its outlet to ensure that all water will run out unrestricted. So again, <coughs> I've gone to installations where the guys have even taken the expansion relief pipe uh, uh, through the tray. And again, it causes restriction. So just making sure that you don't use that as a sleeve and, uh, and restrict the water. Discharge pipe must be suitable for hot water as required in SANS 102.52.1, Section 8. And drainage principles of SANS 102.52 must be employed. Gradients and no 90 degree elbows on horizontal runs, etc. So again, back to that first question that was asked, 45 degree bends, is it only related to the TP discharge pipe? The answer to that is no. It also applies in terms of the outlet pipe from the tray. And again, just making sure that that pipe is supported. So if you go to that SANS 102.52 part 2, that speaks specifically in terms of, of drainage and how that waste pipe should be supported. It speaks of a minimum of 1 in 100 fall from the outlet of the tray to the point of discharge. So making sure that that pipe is supported on its length horizontally uh, this can be done by various means, and I'm certainly not talking about a piece of uh, string and uh, <coughs> other contraptions that I've seen and used, but basically by supporting and putting additional battens underneath and supporting that pipe so that it doesn't bow over its length. All too often I've gone to sites and uh, <coughs> there's no support between the tray and the outlet going out through the wall. And uh, obviously the weight of water that's coming out, depending on the weight and the, the flow of water, that pipe is going to bend, dislodge off of the uh, outlet pipe or outlet from the tray, going to dislodge from there and cause considerable damage to the property. So just make sure that that pipe is supported correctly. And it is one of those items that the, uh, the auditors, inspectors will pick up on as they go out and do the inspection. And back to that thermal insulation, and again, thermal insulation must be installed on hot and cold pipe work if directed in terms of SANS 102.52.1, section 6. Three meters from the hot water outlet, cold water pipe, first one meter from the inlet, and the first one meter of the temperature and pressure discharge pipe. <coughs> now, bearing in mind, if this was a new installation, then all of the uh, hot water piping would be lagged, but in terms of this replacement, in terms of the fixed electric storage water heater, and if there is no other lagging on there, as the responsible plumber, you're required to put a minimum of three meters of lagging on that hot water uh, piping. So again, just making sure that uh, you <coughs> carry out that uh, installation in the correct manner, while the remaining pipe work should be noted to the client and see below for written non-compliance. So just making sure that the client is aware of that non-compliance uh, of the additional pipe work that hasn't been lagged. 
and again must be a minimum of R1 rated. The pipe shall be firmly anchored to prevent water hammer and dislodgement of joints. This is one of those pre pre critical ones that I see on a daily daily basis where pipe work in the roof space is not protected and supported. So again, <coughs> we had one in Marisburg where uh, after two years <coughs> a pipe actually dislodged from a valve and the question it would ask, you know, what actually caused this. So again, there could be various things in terms of water hammer, uh, just in terms of flow rates, if you've throttled that pipe and you start to get movement, it puts uh, uh, stress on the joints and uh, yeah, you end up with one dislodging from the actual uh, location and flooding the ceiling space or void or whatever. Compliance table for replacement, again we're going through in terms of regulations, SANS 102.52.1, uh, and then these regulations, 181, 1848, 198, 752, 105, 63, and 76, these all relate back to materials, pipes, fittings, and components, and fixtures that are used on that installation. So again, it makes very specific reference in terms of uh, the materials used, in terms of that installation, they must be compliant, uh, in terms of uh, the relevant standards. Materials, pipes, fittings, component fixtures must be installed as per regulation and manufacturer's guidelines. So again, making sure that uh, the manufacturer's guidelines are followed, it also makes specific reference to that in 10254 where it actually states about how they'll be installed and uh, also bringing into uh, to play is the manufacturer's regulations or manufacturer specifications. And the other one, just to throw in the mix, is also your local bylaws. So again, making sure that you incorporate all of those when you're doing that installation. So <clears throat> bylaws vary from province to province. Uh, as the responsible plumber, you would have an indication of exactly what's required uh, in terms of those regulations and meeting the requirements. Connections to all components must be union type for ease of replacement. That should quite straightforward be a no-brainer that uh, in order to remove something, you need a mechanical fitting or a union type fitting for ease of replacement. So again, when I say it should be quite easy, uh, yes, if I had 10 rand for every installation I've gone to where the guy hasn't had a Conex fitting and he's used a capillary fitting to connect up the hot water or the inlet to the geyser or whatever uh, and I've had to go and get the hacksaw out and start cutting and uh, replacing pipes to get that geyser out. So again, very clear in terms of the standards. Connections to all components must be union type for ease of replacement. Adequate access must be provided, provided to remove or maintain or replace any com component. Again, quite easy. Uh, you know, somebody once asked me where are geysers uh, installed and I've often said that they're installed in the most inaccessible places on in the house. So again, in cupboards, below houses, in cupboards, uh, in roof space where you've got to take the roofs off. Again, there's specific reference to where and how uh, ex ex access is required to the geyser and the components. So making sure that if you're installing a geyser in the roof space, that there is adequate uh, 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 access to all of the components, not just one, not just two, it says all of the components. So make sure that that's done. And if for a new build, if you, if you come across that, again, it goes back to what the compliance is. The installation must be compliant. And if it's not accessible, then that visa is deemed to be non-compliant because you, uh, you can't get to the pipes and fittings. It, it won't be the first or last we have gone to a geezer that looks like it's been wedged in with a spoon into a cupboard, uh, basically assembled and pushed into a cupboard that you can't get the element or the thermostat out or remove the TP valve, etc. So again, just make sure that you have adequate space around uh, the hot water cylinder in order of servicing. Trigger areas are compliance, pipe and pipe fittings, copper, plastic, stainless steel, mild steel, galvanized medium, all pipes must be fixed as per the manufacturer in SANS 102.52.16 and 5 and 8. So again, go back to what the requirements are. You know, we often seem to think that uh, one <coughs> type of fixation in terms of millimeters apart applies to all uh, pipes. Incorrect. If you go and have a look at uh, 102.52.1, uh, in terms of that, they have specific reference and that of the manufacturer in terms of the spacing of not only horizontal, but vertical pipe work. So again, when you're applying and doing that installation, make sure that, that uh, those tables are carried out correctly in terms of fixations. Components, talking about thermostats, trays, 
uh, water heaters, valves, flood valves, uh, isolating valves. All of those thermostats must be manufactured and tested against SANS 181, TRAYS 1848. The key one is that 1514 uh, fixed up water heater. So all geysers need to be tested in terms of SANS 151. Valves are 198, flood valve 752, isolating valve SANS 105.6. Point three, and that's for bore valves, and SAN 776 uh, for gate valves. Connections to all components, storage tanks, valves, pumps, etc., must be union type for ease of replacement. So again, making sure if you've got an isolating valve that's double female, that you make sure that you have um, union type fittings in place in order to remove those components. And that would apply in terms of valves where you need to add fittings. It's not a capillary fitting that you would utilize, again, going back to union type. <coughs> the hot water cylinder, the integrity of the hot water cylinder and the valves must meet SANS 151 requirements. So that's how they basically test hot water cylinders in terms of SANS 151. What is the spec to class of copper pipe utilized on a geyser installation? Going back to the manufacturer's uh, guidelines and warranties, okay, uh, you'll find that there's a discrepancy between the two, <clears throat> but basically we have two manufacturers of copper pipe in South Africa. You've got uh, Maxil and uh, Copper Tubes Africa. And the requirement in terms of capillary fittings, <clears throat> basically from stroke uh, naught, in terms of uh, utilizing uh, compression fittings, again, it goes back to stroke one or two, and that goes back to the requirements of the manufacturer. So if you go and have a look at the tables in terms of uh, Maxil and CTA, they make specific reference in terms of where that pipe can be utilized, where it be above or below ground, and in some cases they say not recommended for use with compression fittings. So just go back to have a look at Maxil and CTA. Right, written notice of non-compliance. When any replacement, repair or maintenance work has been done on any components in the system, a written notice of all non-compliances must be given by the owner, by the plumber to the owner or occupants for the owner's attention. Now I think this is the key one <coughs> that, that needs to be addressed. Again, as I said earlier, if you don't know what the standard is in terms of that installation, how are you actually going to write out that notice of non-compliance? And if you don't know how to write out that notice of non-compliance, then you're putting yourself and your business at risk. We have a thing called the Consumer Protection Act, and in the event that the, the consumer, owner, whatever, uh, has or experiences losses uh, due to contractors, etc., then uh, it will put you in a very negative light in terms of that. So just make sure that you, you cover that. And IOPSA do have a checklist that's out there. I think you can get it off the IOPSA uh, page or whatever, but it, it actually goes through in terms of the non-compliance. So again, you, it's just a tick box, tick box, tick box. Okay. A plumbing certificate of compliance from the Plumbing Industry Registration Board, PIRB, the SACWA registered professional body for plumbers, shall be issued for the installation, replacement, or repair of any plumbing works carried out <coughs> on the hot water reticulation system. So again, just making sure that uh, all of those items that are non-compliant, you bring to the attention of the owner stroke user. And it's just as simple as that, guys. It's like, the only way I can put it is if you take your car in for a service or your company van in for a service, and they service it, when you pick up that vehicle, if it's gone to a reputable mechanic, basically what they'll do is they'll also do a 100-point check or a 50-point check or whatever. And when you pick your vehicle up, they will tell you that a, um, you know, your brakes need to be done and this needs to be done and everything else. So they will go through all of those items with you. And it's not that they've repaired them, it's just that they're making you aware of those items. Okay, in terms of that, these tables do not cover all aspects of the compliance as required by regulation and standards. You are still responsible to comply with all regulations and standards and refer to point 12 in amateur A, non-compliance note to SANS 10254 for guideline to all areas of compliance. In terms of table C, as we're going through, again, these are where it starts to uh, 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 just duplicate a bit in terms of repairs and maintenance. So again, uh, I don't want to just fly through this. If there are questions, just putting them through. But again, repairs and maintenance of a trip tray, okay? 
It goes back in terms of the sands requirement must be undertaken when the repairs and maintenance of drip tray is undertaken. Repair and maintenance shall include the replacement of drip tray and or installation of new drip tray to an existing installation. So again, it goes back to uh, you know the pipes and fittings. So if you're removing the tray, if it's got a hole in it, when you're putting it back, you need to just ensure that that uh, insulation for the tray, the pipework is supported, etc. So it's not that it wasn't supported before. When you finished, it needs to be installed in terms of the requirements. In terms of materials, parts, fittings, and components, again, installed as per the regulation and manufacturer's guideline. Access, uh, we've spoken about that earlier. Adequate access must be provided to remove or maintain or replace any component. Again, drip tray installed in the correct manner. Discharge pipe must be installed and sloped and supported towards outlet and to ensure that all water will run out unrestricted. The size of the drip tray shall be such that it will cover the total area of the heater and associated component. So again, we discussed it. This is just belts and braces. And again, this is where, for example, you weren't replacing uh, the geyser, but you were doing components or uh, elements, thermostats, etc., uh, valves, vacuum breakers. Discharge pipes must be suitable for hot water. Again, when you go and have a look at a lot of the installation you go to, it's the cheapest and nastiest pipe that can be used in terms of that tray. Uh, and again, this will be non-compliant because, again, specific reference to that sounds 102.5.2.1 and that the pipe must be utilized uh, for hot uh, water and again that cable ducting pipe that comes out, that, that black one, again will not meet the requirement of uh, SANS 102.5.2.1 in terms of the grading of that pipe. So just making sure that you cover the bases in terms of that. Discharge of the pipe and easily visible. It's quite simple. Mounting, we've spoken about the, the way in which the, uh, the tray and how it will be supported in terms of the timber. We've spoken about each foot of the water heater must rest uh, on a support beam. And again, talking about geysers up to 200 litres in terms of bracketing. Again, in terms of this, plumbing certificate of compliance must be issued. So if you've replaced the tray and you are you know, your power week out, etc., then the requirement is that a certificate of compliance is issued. And again, denoting those items. Repairs, maintenance, the temperature pressure valve, same thing applies. The following critical areas of compliance in terms of the SAMS requirements must be undertaken when the repair, maintenance of the temperature and pressure valve is undertaken. Repair and maintenance shall include the replacement of a temperature and pressure valve and or installation of a temperature and pressure valve to an existing installation. So again, going back to very clear in terms of the specification with regards to pipes and fittings <coughs> and making sure that they comply in terms of the relevant standard. Materials, pipes and fittings and components and fixtures must be installed as per the regulation and manufacturer's uh, guidelines. Again, we've spoken about the components must be union type for ease of replacement. Adequate access must be provided to remove. So again, that access and access accessibility is key and vital in terms of uh, the certificate of compliance. Temperature and pressure valve shall be have the same pressure rating. The pressure rating of the temperature and pressure valve must may be less than the rate of pressure of the storage water heater, but shall never exceed it. Again, we're going back to discharge pipes, and as we touched on earlier, they'll never be joined together. Again, uh, independently taken out, led to a discharge point which is visible outside of the building. It cannot be blocked and be installed in a manner that will obviate the development of water traps prevent the free return of air into the system. And bear in mind, a lot of installations that I've gone to, they've taken the expansion relief valve, for example, from uh, the geyser, pushed it through the tiles, and then it discharges onto the roof, or they've brought it through and brought it into the gutters. Okay, Again, it just makes very clear in terms of the discharge, so it must, it must be clearly visible. <clears throat> and uh, basically, in terms of a lot of the bylaws, it makes specific reference in terms of that. So taking the TP discharge pipe, for example, into a uh, PVC gutter, again, I've seen quite a few of those, and when the TP has discharged, uh, it's taken out every single piece of the gutter uh, in terms of uh, the heat of the water, it's distorted the gutters. And again, these are not visible. They're not positioned in a place where you can actually see them. Be installed in a manner that will obviate the development of water traps, we've discussed. Size not less than the size of the outlet of the valve for which the pipe is intended. 
always be of metal inclined downwards away from the valve and thermal insulation must be installed one meter on the temperature and pressure discharge pump. So again, also what we need to take into consideration and I often see it is that the support pipework of the temperature pressure discharge pump. So inevitably what happens, it will come out to the back of the geyser, top of the geyser, uh, two uh, capillary elbows and then basically that pipe runs the whole length of maybe three or four meters with no support on it whatsoever so other than where it goes out through the building. So again, you can just imagine when you look at the, the type of temperature and the pressure that comes out of that cylinder when uh, the thermostat fails and that valve opens, the pressure that's put on those joints is, uh, <coughs> yeah, the velocity and the temperature and pressure can create that pipe, it's going to rattle. So again, the support of that pipe, because there's nothing going through it while you're installing it, in the event of it being uh, uh, the, the safety valve opening and that discharging, again, if not supported correctly, you may end up with a pipe that dislodges uh, from the actual uh, valve itself and then just causing destruction in the ceiling. Again, in terms of that, one is the regular compliance uh, uh, issued and incorporate written notice of non-compliance. So make sure, guys, this is not to say you must go and fix up that whole installation. I hear that often, that how can we go into somebody's house and uh, just repipe out the whole system. It's not that. Okay, the key component here is that you make the client aware of the non-compliance. Utilize this as a foundation document. It's not to generate income and it's not out there to put uh, people uh, uh, in the negative in terms of their bank balance, but as being the professional. Uh, you would expect that from the mechanic when you serviced your car. If you went down the road and <coughs> couldn't uh, put your foot in the brake and you went through uh, somebody's wall and you went back to the <coughs> the mechanic and said, well, why didn't you tell me? Again, you would expect that from a professional, that they would advise you. And then the decision is made by the consumer. So just make sure that you make the consumer aware of those items of non-compliance. Don't put yourself at risk. Repairs, maintenance, and expansion control valve. Again, going back very straightforward, parts and components all fall into line as we've discussed before. The expansion relief must be <coughs> SANS approved as well as the fittings and components, connections to all components. Again, we talked about being union type ease of replacement and again, accessibility. In terms of the expansion control valve, the expansion control valve shall have the same pressure rating as other valves used in the system. The pressure rating of the expansion control valve may be less than the rated pressure of the storage water heater. An isolating valve, gate valve, non-return valve or any other flow control valve shall not be provided between an expansion control valve and the water heater. So quite simple in terms of, <coughs> so the discharge pipe from the expansion control valve shall be, never be joined together with other discharge pipes, led to a discharge point which is visible outside the building and in a position where the discharge from the pipe will not cause a nuisance or cannot be blocked, installed in a manner that will obviate development of water traps and size not less than the size of the outlet of the valve for which the pipe is intended. So again, very specific in terms of how that is and again, coming into play is the supporting of this pipe. All too often uh, guys have gone out to site and pictures that I see of installations. Uh, we don't add sufficient uh, time uh, to that pipe. It's often uh, 10 meters of polycop cut off, quickly shoved through the outside of the building and connected to the expansion relief and uh, with no consideration of water traps or support of that pipe. So again, when the auditor inspector goes out to site, he is going to bring that into play. So just making sure that you support that pipe correctly. Again, a certificate of compliance being issued and the notice of non-compliance to the consumer. Very straightforward in terms of uh, that area. Maintenance of a pressure control valve, the following critical areas of compliance, so we talked about that. Components, we talked about all the pipes, fittings and components and fixtures used in the repair must be SANS 10252 part 1 and section 5 when applicable. The supplier must be able to provide the proof that the component complies to the relevant SANS standard and then must be listed on the JASBIC acceptance list. So again, just touching in terms of, of compliance types and fittings and components, making sure that uh, those fittings that you're utilizing on that installation, we're talking about pipes, but all of the fixtures and fittings are compliant. Material pipes, fittings, components and fixtures must be installed as per regulation and manufacturer's guidelines. Okay. 
can if we stick to that. Uh, we'll have no problems in terms of compliance. Okay, union type. <coughs> Adequate access must be provided to remove or maintain or replace any component. Pressure control valve shall have the same pressure rating. The pressure rating of the pressure control valve may be less than the rate of pressure of the storage water heater, but shall never exceed it. The location of the pressure control valve must be related to the required downstream flow pressures. So again, if you go into SANS 102.5.2.1, <coughs> very specific tables in terms of uh, the flow rates and positioning of those valves. So obviously for a pressure system or a semi-pressure system, again, the positioning of that valve is determined uh, in terms of where that valve can be installed. And bear in mind, we're also talking about balanced systems, so where those valves are installed uh, to ensure that uh, the systems are balanced. Again, <coughs> certificate of compliance and written notice of non-compliance. So straightforward in terms of, of uh, that. All materials, pipes, fittings, components, as we've said before, used in the repair and maintenance must meet the SANS 102.52.1, section 5 when applicable. The supplier must be able to provide proof. <clears throat> I think we'll just touch on that one a little bit, where that supplier must be able to provide proof. There are materials and components out there that may not necessarily be uh, 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 within the system, and if you're unsure, then it's you have the right to actually ask <coughs> the merchant or the uh, manufacturer for the actual reference that those components, uh, in terms of the standard, meet the standard. Just don't take, sorry guys, I'm jumping forward. Just don't take for granted that, you know, when you go into a merchant's uh, store, <coughs> that uh, whatever you've been supplied is the correct thing. Don't ever be put yourself in a position where you picked up this new material or whatever uh, and you've gone and installed it and then you find out six months later that it's non-compliant or it doesn't comply. So if, if the, the merchant or, or cannot provide you with that, just ask them for that info in terms of uh, providing proof that the component complies to the relevant SAN standard and it must be listed on the JASWIC acceptance list. So just make sure that you... Uh, uh, keep that in, in terms of uh, the materials that you are supplied and that you install. All right, we're going to go into our next poll, and there's only two sort of answers in terms of that. In your opinion, compliance is a hindrance or an opportunity? If we could uh, get your fingers up and running and jump on that one. Okay, we're about halfway with the votes. Just a quick one while we're waiting. Seeing that all geezers have a compression inlet class one should be used. That's it's your a statement question. So seeing that all geezers have a compression inlet class one should be used. Is that correct? Okay, <clears throat> a hindrance or an opportunity. Thank you, guys. I think uh, our webinar is certainly uh, adding a little bit of value there. Yes, it's an opportunity. And just getting back to that other question, we'll get back to that one now. We have got a couple of slides going through. Uh, again, we may run over a little bit late, Bianca, about another 10 minutes, guys. Would that be okay? Uh, I haven't put you all to sleep. <clears throat> Are you all still awake? Uh, and would it be okay? We're running with a couple of questions coming through. We're running about sort of five or ten minutes. Would that be all right, Bianca? You can all just raise your hands if you're happy to, to hang on for a few extra minutes. And we've got a majority, yes. So that's not a problem. We can do so. Thank you, everybody. I think that, you know, again, it's critical. There is a lot of info to go through here, and you will see that, you know, we, again, we, we're doing belts and braces, but I think, you know, you've got the gist of the fact that when you're installing an item, just making sure that it actually complies in terms of the standards and that how it's actually installed in terms of uh, uh, compliance, and that goes through in terms of vacuum breakers. So, again, vacuum breakers shall be installed in both hot and cold. You guys all know that. Vacuum control valves uh, shall be installed in both hot and cold water pipes. 
quite simple in terms to ensure that there's no siphonage of water uh, from the actual hot water cellar. Again, if they're non-compliant, going back to the compliance certificate and non-compliant. So making sure. So as an example, and I think we go through all of these items, but if you've gone out to an installation and you've replaced the, the PRV, for example, but you notice that the vacuum breakers are, are incorrect, you notice that the pipe work from the tray is not supported, if you notice that uh, uh, the temperature pressure discharge pipe has the wrong size pipe or it's not supported, again, it's up to you being the professional just to denote those items and bring it to the attention of the actual consumer and invariably and I, and I say this from experience invariably the client will ask you for a costing to do that and again that's an opportunity for you to actually uh, uh, add another service call but again it's not all about that it's about the compliance and it's about making sure that you are covered in the event that there's a problem Again, this goes through in terms of isolating control valves. Again, it talks about the components um, to meet the SANS 10252 Part 1. It's Section 5 of how those, um, those valves are installed. And again, when you go out into your merchants, I often see it, there's a multitude of valves and everything out there. If you're not sure, you know, if it doesn't have the SABS mark on it or reference to that, then ask the question of the actual uh, supplier and say, is this <coughs> you know, a compliant uh, product? If it isn't, and uh, you know, you've put in a certificate of compliance and, and the auditor or the inspector goes out to site <coughs> and soon picks that up, you may be in a position where you've got to go back and rectify that. So again, just make sure that you ask the question of the uh, merchant. Again, materials, pipe fittings, components, fixtures installed as per regulation, Access and uh, isolating control valves shall not be provided between any expansion relief device or a vacuum relief. So again, making sure that you don't have anything between the two. Again, it goes back to that certificate of compliance. And again, it's not a phone call, guys. The standard very clearly states in terms of, of uh, uh, the national building regulations that non-compliance must be in writing. So it's not verbally, it's not, hey, Mrs. Jones, by the way, you need to fix that. It needs to go in writing because, again, writing is going to be your proof that in the event that there is a problem on site, and we might not be talking uh, a month, two months, three months, four months, it might be five years down the line where somebody climbs onto the bandwagon and you're now held responsible. So just make sure that you document uh, in terms of that. And it'll go on your certificate of compliance that you issue. <coughs> Components, again, something that, uh, again, is just belts and braces every time in terms of uh, pipe work. The pipe shall be firmly anchored to prevent water hammer and dislodgement of joints. So again, making sure, and it's not to be used using three inch nails bent over the pipe work, etc. Again, in the required manner. Thermal insulation, as we've spoken about before, must be installed on the repaired hot and cold pipe work is directed in terms of SANS 102.5.2.1, uh, three meters from the hot water outlet, one meter from the inlet, and the first one meter of the temperature and pressure discharge pipe. <coughs> Again, while the standard reflects all hot water pipes, IOPSA recommends three meters, while the remaining pipe work should be noted to the client in writing on your non-compliance. So again, make allowance for that in terms of your installation or your repair when you're doing that. Don't be uh, in a position where you'll turn around and say, I don't know. <coughs> again, in terms of uh, the compliance, and we're nearly at the end of it, guys, so just bear with me. Thermostat, the discharge pipe from the temperature and pressure valve shall never be joined, led to the discharge point, which is visible outside. This is when we're replacing a thermostat, uh, be installed in a manner that will obviate development of water traps and all that pipe So just make sure that all of those items are done. And then in terms of the element, that ensure that siphonage of the water heater is prevented. So make sure that there's an anti-siphon loop in terms of uh, uh, that installation. So again, it may be an installation where uh, there is insufficient siphon loop or anti-siphon loop. And for those that don't know about that, it's where your cold water will rise up above your geyser, just at the top of your geyser, and that drop down to the cold water inlet, making sure that that anti-siphon loop is created. So it's belts and braces in terms of the cold water vacuum breaker, and just making sure that uh, that is done and constructed and done correctly. <coughs> PIRB audits. When an audit is undertaken, the compliance table will give guidance to the PIRB auditors for any installation, maintenance, or replacement of the fixed electric geyser. 
If the minimum compliance is not met on an installation, the replacement or repair, the license plan will be, will be issued a PILB rectification notice. So again, if you've issued a certificate of compliance and the auditor goes out there and then finds areas of uh, non-compliance that you haven't logged, then you may be required to go back and rectify. If any of the items do not meet the regulation requirements, the installer must issue the building owner with a notice of non-compliance. So again, we're just emphasizing that non-compliance notice. It's more so for yourself to just cover you and make sure that you don't fall foul of the law. SANS 10254 in compliance, the critical compliance table must be read in conjunction with SANS regulation <laughs> and the notice of non-compliance. So making sure that uh, you know you understand those standards, and I think it's it is difficult. Uh, it's a massive book and download of information, but certainly just take the time, go through, read it. It's like they say, if you're going to eat an elephant, how do you do that? Uh, one bite at a time. So as you go through, have an inquiry mind and go through and have a look at it. And I think you know, as I often say, a lot of the webinars is knowledge is key. You know, if you apply that knowledge. Uh, to your installations. It's going to assist you in terms of your uh, standing within the plumbing fraternity. You're going to understand the changes. You're going to be there to be able to correct those that say uh, one is contrary to the other. Is going to uh, affect your bottom line in terms of repeat calls. You're going to be seen as the professional that you are in the lights, in the eyes of the consumer because, again, you've taken the time to bring uh, these areas of non-compliance to the attention of the consumer. So in terms of that, <coughs> make sure that you utilize that to benefit yourselves. Uh, in terms of myself and just thanking Bianca and IOPSA and Plumbing, I think Plumbing probably the best. <coughs> I hope that this workshop has been of assistance and prize you with a better insight into this crucial notice regarding plumbing regulation, uh, regulations. I think for me, uh, it's, it's a pleasure <coughs> sitting down just talking to you all right across the, the country and I thank you for your time. I know how busy you are and uh, <coughs> again, uh, thank you very much for attending. If you value what I've said today and if you've gained any experience, please uh, share it with us. Thank you very much for those questions during the, uh, the webinar. Uh, they keep us on our toes and uh, yeah, we've got time constraints, but thank you very much guys for, for the time. Bianca, over to you. Um, we just have one question here. What about covers for vacuum breakers? There are some on the market, probably non-compliant. Is it a good thing or not to install them, seeing it as is not compulsory? It would mean additional safety for the homeowner if a good type is used. What is the general thought on that? <clears throat> Again, in terms of uh, you know the covers for vacuum breakers, they are look invariably you know when you look at a, a geyser tray and you look at how that is invariably I've I've never seen you know the terminology in terms of my geysers burst. You know when I notice anything bursting, it's a bang and it's made a big noise and there's a huge amount of water. But for me. Uh, yes, they are. Even some of the valve manufacturers actually came out with a vacuum breaker. You could actually connect uh, a piece of composite pipe to it and basically interconnect it to and take it outside. But invariably, most of the damage that comes, you know, is from a vacuum breaker. When a vacuum breaker fails, um, it basically sprays everywhere. Uh, what you've got to bear in mind is that, you know, when those covers are utilized, and we talk about the, the SANS documentation, and that those vacuum breakers are, are manufactured to open uh, at a certain KPA. So whatever is done in terms of uh, uh, that uh, protective cover or whatever, we've just got to make sure that it has been tested, you know, in terms of uh, SABS. A large majority of them, as far as I know, are not uh, SABS approved product. But again, we're just going to make sure that what we actually put on there does not negate the the, the, the atmospheric uh, pressure that, that uh, operates the workings of that vacuum breaker. But to me, certainly anything that's going to alleviate uh, 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 the, the damage caused by a hot or cold water vacuum breaker discharging in the roof, because again, you can have a tray there, but you know, at, at 450 kPa when that vacuum breaker goes, <clears throat> an umbrella wouldn't be big enough to uh, discharge or take away that water or, or stop the damage. So yes, I would just check with your uh, manufacturer and those guys that have made them. There are some very innovative guys out there that have done this. And again, it would be an add-on to the sale. But just check in terms of uh, compliance and testing of that. Okay, next we've got... How much do you bond the geezer? 
Okay, in terms of earthing and bonding, again, when you purchase that geyser, you'll see that there's an earth that actually comes to the cylinder, and your bonding and earthing is basically between your hot and cold water pipework, okay? Now, bearing in mind that it's there um, to bond, so there is earth strapping, basically, that you would utilize between the two with a nut, so you would bend that across the top, uh, normally done <coughs> between vacuum breakers or in terms of the hot and the cold. Basically, it's done there, earth strapping used. Uh, secured with a nut and, and uh, uh, bolt on either end, and that just transitions that electricity. But bearing in mind that if you've gone and put a piece of polycop or composite pipe between that, you actually break that continuity of earth. So if you've got you know metallic piping below ground, everything else, uh, that's normally where it gets earthed. Years ago, plumbers used to actually put earth spikes in. It was part and parcel of our job. I'm showing my age now. But basically, in terms of those earth spikes, it was a copper spike put into the ground, and then you would actually see underneath the basins, they would actually uh, earth <coughs> both the hot and colds and taps, etc. So in house, you would go and you just touch it, you get a bit of a shock. You would see that the earth is done. And what we found going forward now is that continuity of the earth is actually broken when there's a pop that's burst in the garden or replaced on the wall is basically what's happening is you're breaking that continuity of earth. But around the geyser, earthing of the geyser goes straight forward in terms of your hot and your uh, live neutral and earth going into it and that earth is basically taken back to the piping and your uh, 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 bonding between your hot and cold water pipework. And then last one I've got here, do you need to fit a non-return valve on the cold water pipe? Is it a must or not? All right, in terms of, again, when we're talking about a non-return valve on a cold water pipe, are we talking about a cold water pipe specific to a Giza Bianca or where are we talking about a non-return valve being installed? Just to get some clarity on that one. Francois, if you can just pop that in the questions for me quickly. If you're putting a non-return valve on your cold water inlet, your geyser, then you're basically going to nullify that uh, that geyser from expanding. So just be careful that, as I've said earlier, that that non-return valve, the position between the pressure control valve and the inlet of the geyser is going to stop the, uh, uh, the expansion of water and the normal workings of that geyser, so it's going to stop that, and then you're going to put the warranty and put the pressure of the cylinder under risk. In terms of uh, uh, cold water inlets and supplies, look, invariably there's a non-return valve built into water meters, so if you're talking about a whole long length of pipe work, in terms of fire, there's a requirement for non-return valves, but there is a requirement in terms of a strainer for cold water supply, so I'm not quite too sure which one they're talking about, Bianca. Okay, we've got you. There are a lot of geysers that if the main water supplies are off, the water flows back in the cold water pipe. Okay, well, quite simply, what that goes back to is what you would pick up in terms of your non-compliance. So, as I said to you earlier, the reason that that happens is, one, the vacuum breaker position on the cold water is installed incorrectly, and the second one is that there's no anti-siphon loop created on the inlet of the geyser. So, if you can imagine uh, your cold water will come in from whichever area it is, the cold water will rise up to a position roughly 100 millimeters higher than the top of the geyser. You'll then branch off, have your vacuum breaker, and then drop down to the cold water inlet. If you do that, then basically what will happen is you will break that anti-siphon. So it's, that's why they call it an anti-siphon loop. But if you connect directly into the geyser without there being a anti-siphon loop. When the corporation isolates the cold water mains, it will create a vacuum and it will pull all of that hot water out through the cold water line and to the taps. And what we find is when that happens, uh, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones opens up the cold water tap, they think they've got a bonus, they're now being supplied hot water by the municipality. And what that does is it actually exposes the element in the actual geyser. So for every litre of the water that you're taking out, you're drawing it out. So it's like you siphon petrol out of a car. You're pulling it out of that cylinder. And what you're going to do is expose the element. So what you're actually going to do is that element's going to burn out. And then eventually when you turn the water on and it goes back to normal, what it's going to then do is trip and then you're back into square one. So if you don't rectify 
the pipe work going into the geyser. That's why we're saying here when you're doing the elements. So if you don't do that pipe work, what you're going to do is have the same problem occur every time the corporation interrupt the mains to the property. So yes, you could position a non-return valve, but that positioning of that non-return valve needs to be in a place where it's not going to affect the actual workings of the expansion relief of the pressure control valve. So be very careful where that is. So you could put it on the outside, but you may still expose the element due to the distance of the pipework. So again, every installation would be different. Uh, you may be able to pull out 20 or 30 liters of water on that anti-siphon before it gets in the non-return valve. So just be very careful how you do that. So better if you install the correct vacuum brake, the correct spacing, and make sure that you have the anti-siphon loop in place. Okay, that's it on our, our question side. Um, oh, wait, can it happen that the vacuum breaker is faulty on the cold water pipe or that is too low? Yes, it can happen. I think that, you know, again, when you go back to that installation where an element's gone, so as a, as a professional plumber, if you're going out to site and it's a fairly new geezer and everything else, so again, making sure that you actually go through all of those things. So very good point. Uh, there are components out there that may or may work or, or may not work, but again, just go through and go and test it. So the first thing for me is always to go and check that installation to make sure position of the vacuum breakers is correct, make sure that the vacuum breakers are actually functioning and working, and again, make sure that that anti-siphon loop is in place. If all of that is in place and that element's gone and it's a fairly new installation, then again, it would go back to, to vacuum breakers. And then just a point for me in terms of vacuum breakers, guys, I, I know it's, uh, yes, if one goes, replace both. I think for me, uh, it won't be the first or last time, that, uh, and I use that often, but again, where you've gone, I'm sure you've experienced it, you put a vacuum breaker on the cold, you know, three weeks down the line, four weeks down the line, the hot one goes and you're in this hole, he said, she said. So just make sure that if you're going to replace the vacuum breakers, just do it as a rule of thumb, replace both, okay? That, you know, the consumer, they've possibly all gone in at the same time, so replace both vacuum breakers, make sure that they're done correctly. And make sure that, you know, it's just not about taking the vacuum breaker off and putting it back where it was. Make sure that that vacuum breaker is positioned correctly in terms of the standard. You don't want to have a situation where the, the warranty of the hot water cylinder is now negated because of the vacuum brake has not been positioned correctly. So yes, uh, as you go through that installation, mental note, cold water, anti-siphon loop going down, nothing there to stop the expansion of water, uh, everything's free flying, overflows are done, everything else. So yes, a vacuum brakers can fail and do sometimes uh, pose problems, but invariably it's that anti-siphon loop that creates a problem or non-installation of an anti-siphon loop. Okay, that seems to now be it from, from all of our questions. Guys, thanks once again for attending this afternoon and letting us just shoot a little bit over. For those who are interested, you can go to IOPSA's website, IOPSA.org. That's I-O-P-S-A dot org. And you can click on the Shop tab which will take you through to the builders shop.co.za. There you will find these non-compliance notification uh, downloads that you can you can receive from IOP. So there are some other things like those um, those installation guideline booklets that you can purchase um, and a number of other things that will help you. Once again, thank you from our side. Thank you from thank you to um, Plumlink, proudly Bidvest. Thank you to IOPSA and Articulate It.